Throughout 2020, I communicated with a being which I believe knew things that I did not. Perhaps it was a figment of my own unconscious mind, or perhaps something else. I'll leave it up to you. I called it an angel, but regardless of what it was or wasn't, I believe the content of our conversations stands on its own merits and warrants serious consideration. It spoke frequently about two types of thinking. But they weren't just two types of thinking. They were two ways of seeing, and two ways of being. A pair of forces, fundamental to everything in the universe, given structure and expression in human behavior. Forces which it claimed sat at the very bottom of everything that is. Most of us today are walking around with two minds in our heads. One is a mind of innocence. It sees what it wants to see and averts its gaze from what it doesn't want to see. It seeks the world of simplicity, ease, and security. It looks for the straight path, the right path, away from chaos, danger, and doubt. The other mind looks for novelty and excitement. The playful mind the mind which tires of the known and yearns for the unknown, which breaks reality to cure its boredom, which runs off the path looking for thrills and monsters in the undiscovered world. The first is a controller. It prefers a world where things make sense, where danger is not, and where all is well. The second is a trickster. It likes surprises, excitement, challenges, and mysteries. These two are naturally adversarial and each has its own pathology. The first mind domesticates you. It makes you small. It hides from change and anything big. It clings to what it has and knows, and will do anything to keep them. So it learns to let nothing change its mind, and hides behind whatever illusions it needs. The second mind distorts reality. It pries into things it can't understand. It sees patterns where there are none, and conjures false explanations. It challenges the unchangeable. It picks fights with nature, and rebels against the way things are. It craves its own reality, and so the one it was given is hideous and full of terrors, and must be torn down. The first submits to what satisfies it. The second rebels against what stifles it. Each mind is animated by one of the two forces. The first mind is pulled by eros, which means desire, but for our purposes you can think of it as substance. The second is pulled by logos, a complicated word that means many things, but here we can boil it down to transformation and creation. It named these two blindness and madness, and provocative as those terms are, I found them rather apt. The blind are those who feel the world, but can't see it. The mad are those who see the world, but can't make sense of it. The first mind tunes the world out. The second mind hallucinates. The reason they do this is because we can't look at everything, and we don't know everything. So we have to ignore most of the world, and we have to see things which may not be there to find out if they are. And the only way to do both is to do both. No perception can be done any other way. Sanity is only a delicate middle between two contending forms of insanity. And if that sounds absurd, I have to ask you, what else could sanity be? Most of us lean one way or the other, ignoring reality or twisting it. But the further we lean, the more deluded we are. This ostensibly normal condition is in fact a kind of low-level schizophrenia. The word schizophrenia literally means split mind. If we were to map the space between these modes, the map would look something like this. At the very top is what the angel called true vision. This is when we only ignore what ought to be ignored, see what must be seen, and the meaning we perceive is not misleading. The state where the two minds are one mind. You see exactly what you are meant to see, 
You enter a kind of divine dance with reality, and always end up in the right place at the right time. Perhaps counterintuitively, or perhaps not, most of us are not there most of the time. Most perception is misperception. This triad of vision is an image of Abraxas, and so it maps on to the Abraxian cosmogram. It is the central axis which the image is built around. At the bottom of the image is this circle, which represents the world, and these two serpents who hold it. Archon means the ruler, and Dracon means the dragon. These two figures represent the twin serpents which are the legs and feet of Abraxas. And just as they're his foundation, they're also the foundation of humanity and the universe. They symbolize the two halves of Eden. Most of you are probably familiar with the story of the Garden of Eden, of the tree of knowledge where dwells the serpent who tempts Adam and Eve into eating its fruit, causing their expulsion from paradise. What many are not aware of is the fact that early Christianity was somewhat divided about how to interpret this story. What became modern Christianity held that the serpent was the devil, who maliciously deceived humanity into defying their benevolent creator. By contrast, several Gnostic sects believed the serpent was a savior, who cured our ignorance and saved us from the malevolent demiurge, who kept us in the garden like chattel. The very interesting thing to me is the fact that each has been framed as both ultimate evil and ultimate good by one side of this theological argument. The fact that both readings make a credible claim would seem to mean both readings are only half true. Eden, then, is exactly what it purports to be, the primordial schism, the first destruction of the oneness of the universe. How we read the story of Eden is important, because it is the lens through which all of history is understood. For that reason, this cosmogram depicts both figures as ambivalent. On the left, the demiurge, who keeps humanity ignorant, infantile, and domesticated. On the right, the devil, who leads us to destruction with his cunning deceptions, forbidden fruit, and rebellion against the divine order. These two are the tyrant and the traitor, the masters of the blind and the mad locked in a never-ending battle which humanity fights on their behalf. This is a rather more bleak cosmology than either that of the Christians or the Gnostics. Worse than that is that it strikes me as more accurate and more honest than either account, each of which assures us that at least one of these two is on our side. It seems more truthful to me to say that each is only on his own side. I believe, therefore, it is of paramount importance to strive towards the true vision the angel spoke about. The only alternative I see is to leave ourselves in the care of forces which do not have our best interests in mind. Neither of these leads anywhere on its own, because they are two halves of a whole. They have no independent existence. Each is both destroyer and creator of the other. I'm going to go over some of what I've been told and you can decide if it sounds credible. Because what I've been working on, and what I plan to continue working on, is mapping a pathway out of this. To find it, we have to look briefly at history, grasp the Christian and Gnostic cosmologies, and then dig deep into this image to extract hidden meaning. After the spread of the teachings of Christ, there was no orthodox theology. Early on, there were only stories of Jesus and his apostles, and many, many interpretations of them. What began to occur was the breaking off of two highly divergent forms. Christianity had to organize and began to form into a hierarchical structure, the institution of the church. Facing persecution on one side and discord on the other, it was necessary to consolidate authority and impose order from above for the preservation of the faith. This current is known historically as proto-orthodoxy. Running contrary to this order were the emerging Gnostic currents. The Gnostic communities organized around a belief in personal, intuitive spiritual knowledge obtained through ongoing revelation and mystical insight. They often taught that ignorance, not sin, was the true obstacle to salvation. Proto-orthodoxy deemed Gnosticism heresy, 
because subversive Gnostic revelations threatened to undermine the unity of the church, which might have resulted in infighting and the total implosion of Christianity. On the other hand, Gnosticism rejected proto-Orthodoxy because its dogmatism threatened to stifle and destroy their spiritual individualism. According to the angel, everything subversive about early Christianity was rejected and became Gnosticism. What resulted was this cleaving of the religion into an extremely dogmatic strain and an extremely subversive and scattered one. The institutional power of the dogmatic religion was harnessed by Emperor Constantine and became what is currently called Christianity. The Gnostic forms facing persecution went underground, mingling with other worldviews and re-emerging periodically, as in the cases of the Cathars and Bogomils. It was not until the Protestant Reformation, when Catholic hegemony was disrupted, that it was really able to become a force in the world again. At that point, it returned as Christian occultism, which is, at least in a practical sense, the same thing. Christian occultism integrated alchemy, astrology, ritual magic, hermeticism, and Kabbalah. In other words, it occupied itself with direct spiritual experience and the mastery of the physical through secret knowledge, the salvation of man by the transcendence of the bonds of matter. It's not Sethian or Valentinian or Basilidean, but it's as Gnostic as it gets. Unlike Christianity, which is a worldview, Gnosticism is rather a type of worldview. This neo-Gnosticism, by prying into creation and seeking its mastery, slowly but surely evolved into what we now know as science. Such a reading of Western religious history makes it very unsurprising that many of us today are carrying emblems of the bitten apple in our back pockets. Gnostics, after all, regard the forbidden fruit as the gateway to salvation. The Christian and Gnostic views of good and evil are quite illustrative of the point I'm trying to make. Mainline Christianity is unique from other religions in its institutional form. No other religion ever created anything quite like the Church. A top-down power structure, which has the authority to perceive spiritual reality on behalf of the entire body of believers. A Catholic, who has significant disagreements with the Catholic Church, is wrong. That's the foundational axiom of Catholicism. And Orthodoxy has a very similar aversion to heterodox theology. Some Protestant denominations are more flexible, and others more rigid. But the common denominator is observance of church authority. In light of this, it's very interesting to look at who the Christians demonize. Namely, the demons. The evil figures in Christian mythology are fallen angels. These are the beings who fought with Lucifer against God. In other words, in Christianity, evil is to disobey. Evil is chaos, subversion, and madness. It's Gnostic. Gnosticism, on the other hand, is profoundly subversive and anti-authority. It emphasizes the importance of individual enlightenment, liberation, and escape from the cosmic order. The God who made matter is tyrannizing us, but by working against him, we can escape natural law and the suffering it inflicts. The enemies of humanity in the Gnostic cosmology are the Archons, the rulers, who conspire to keep us here, to keep us enslaved, and impose their evil will on us. For Gnostics, evil is power. Evil is the willful ignorance and submission to authority, which perpetuates cycles of suffering. Hopefully, you're beginning to see the connections. Dogmatic Christianity explicitly makes discerning truth, makes seeing, the role of someone else. It is openly dependent upon faith in the others who saw and see for you. By contrast, Gnosticism bears a fair resemblance to paranoid psychosis. The world is literally out to get them. That's their cosmology. The forces of evil are everywhere. They are in everything. Only the Gnostic knows the truth, and evil doesn't want them to know. I would not go so far as to call these worldviews blind or mad. I'm simply pointing out that they diverged from one another in those directions. The fact that the split went this way, and that we can see the same duality in the story of the fall, 
I think lends credibility to the idea that these truly are the poles of the human mind. The great problem is that even though these traditions are widely abandoned in the modern world, this split never went away. Instead, we have barreled yet further along these trajectories into far more unhinged extreme forms in ideology, nihilism, and all manner of bizarre, political, cosmological, and spiritual ideas. Gnostics at least recognized the spiritual authority of Christ, and Christians at least admitted there was much they did not see. While each has its excesses, they were both far more sane than anything which has sprung up in their place. What we arrive at here at the beginning of the New Age are two psychological dispositions, each acting out its own Edenic story. Those who lean towards blindness try to be the obedient Adam and Eve. They content themselves with the fruits they're allowed and resist the temptations of the serpent. Those who lean towards madness play the rebellious Adam and Eve. They revolt against the garden, seek forbidden knowledge, and conspire with the serpent against their masters. It doesn't seem to be working out. Regardless of what the best way forward might be, we're never going to find it doing what we're doing. I don't know if I have the solution, but I have the beginning of a solution, and I think it's worth looking at. These circles in the four corners of the cosmogram each represent a suit of the tarot and a classical element. The demiurge represents pentacles and earth, and the serpent represents wands and fire. The serpent is, of course, Lucifer, a name which means light bringer. He's associated with treachery and forbidden knowledge, so there's a natural connection with fire. Fire is the greatest of all forbidden fruits, the miraculous and terrible power which seduced our ancestors, which birthed civilization and all of its glories and disasters. He is the overthrower of the natural order, the destroyer of the world. The suit of wands is the one most obviously connected to magic, the mastery and manipulation of reality, which in the popular imagination is frequently and unsurprisingly connected with Satan. Here the wand is symbolized with the caduceus, the staff of Hermes, which is as often associated with magic as with medicine. The demiurge is Yaldabaoth, who traps souls in bodies and traps bodies in the world. When we obey the authorities of the world, it is he who rewards us with wealth and status and power. When we disobey, it is he who punishes us with hunger, disease, poverty, and death. He demands strict adherence to his iron laws. He punishes for generations and is not quick to forget defiance. But he is the creator of the world, and without him there is no beauty and no order to drive back the brutality of nature. There is nothing that protects anyone from anything. Only the physical needs and animal instincts make life, love, and happiness possible. We sit in the precarious position between these two great dangers, but without both, not a single good thing could ever occur. It is the body which plays instruments, and the awakened mind which writes music. If you think life is worth living, you cannot hate either of them. And that's why together, the pentacle and the caduceus tie the whole cosmogram together. Because when the pair of them are reconciled and unified, holding reality together is exactly what they do. And when separated, they tear it to pieces. That's why they are the legs and feet of Abraxas. They are the foundation of everything by which all things stand or fall. It's a terrifying picture of the universe, and one which offers only a flickering ray of hope far in the distance. I think it also happens to be an honest picture, and one which demands us to become better than what we are. It is a picture which places every human being on the razor's edge, sightless and deluded, with hell on the left and hell on the right. Make no mistake, that's exactly where you are. There is no easy way out. There is no escape. 
and there is no one who can hold the line for you. And it is becoming far too dangerous to keep thinking otherwise. So how is one to attain true vision and pacify this war for the universe? Well, to answer this question, we should look at those who have done so. There is a very interesting motif which occurs in both the Egyptian and Norse mythologies between the gods Horus and Odin. Horus was a kind of god of vision. He had the head of a falcon and represented the sky. This was his symbol, the eye of Horus. So it's quite a strange thing that in the stories, he ends up with only one eye. In a confrontation with the god Seth, Horus's left eye is gouged out. And then when the eye was restored, he gave it to his father Osiris. The Norse god Odin was the god of wisdom. But to obtain wisdom, he had to trade an eye to drink the magic water of the well of Mimir. Quite a strange idea that some vision would be given up to obtain wisdom. It was said that the two eyes of Horus, who was the god of the sky, were the sun and moon. The moon was his left, the one which was gouged out. If we return to the cosmogram, we find the moon on the left and the sun on the right. Between them, an iris and pupil. A third eye, right where a forehead would be. This is an eclipse, both eyes at once. The eye of God which witnesses all. To be one-eyed is to have one eye which lets in nothing, and one eye which lets in everything. An eye of darkness and light, of restriction and generation, of Saturn and Jupiter, of blindness and madness. The left lunar eye is right above the demiurge, the blind serpent. It's right next to the sphere of judgment and comprehension, and it's under Eros. The right solar eye is above the devil, the mad serpent. It's next to the sphere of openness and wisdom, and it's under Logos. So I submit to you that to gain the eclipse's eye of true vision, we must first recognize the spirits of blindness and madness within ourselves. We must perceive that everything we do is a function of these either in greater or lesser harmony. We must master them and exercise both simultaneously in all that we do. Leave always one eye blinded by obedience to order and one eye open to the light of possibility. In his book Ion, which pertained to the turning of the age, Carl Jung suggested that the two fish of the age of Pisces symbolized Christ and Antichrist, Christianity and science. I suggest a subtle reframe. The two fish are the warring spirits of Yaldabaoth and Lucifer, two spirits whose reconciliation with one another may result in the restoration of the oneness of God and of the human soul thereby. It is an extremely bizarre picture of the world and of human psychology, and yet it just seems to make sense to me, and there's nothing I can do to change my mind. The material I've presented since December rended my mind when it all first revealed itself. I think several times I nearly lapsed into a psychosis, one I might never have fully recovered from. I think that danger has passed now, and I feel in many ways more sane than I ever was. What's happened has annihilated every theory of reality I've ever put any faith in. In my opinion, It's annihilated every theory of reality I've ever been offered by anyone. The experience left me with no bedrock except itself. It is eerily similar in expression to the delirious fantasies of a lunatic, and yet it has an uncanny coherence, a clarity and lucid elegance that neither I nor any pathology or coincidence could have produced. I don't feel like I'm going insane. I feel like I'm going sane, and the world is way weirder than I ever thought to imagine. I plan to talk a lot more about these strange ideas. Hopefully it will be interesting and useful.
Until then, thanks for watching, and be well.